It's like the morning sun shining down on us. Jesus, you have overcome. You will never leave us. Love is like the morning sun shining down on us. Jesus, you have overcome. Welcome, everybody. We're going to keep going. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life, yeah. You reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign. Above it all. On the cross, the work is finished. God, you pulled out your life just to give us new life. From the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise. Cause Jesus, you're alive. Oh. Above it all, you reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher 
You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. A seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. A seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running. have a seat everybody can't think of a better song to transition from one year to the next than lyrics like that uh, there is a God who reigns as he reigned over 2021 he reigns over 2022 and before I get into the message this morning uh, we just need to take a time as a congregation and we've got some situations to be praying about together that's what it means to be a spiritual family together right um, whether we have great breakthrough mountaintop moments or we have some deep gut-wrenching valley moments, we're together as a family, and this is a family um, that prays together and supports each other and journeys together. And so uh, we've got two particular families, and then I'm going to give an invitation for anyone else who's come in um, that you can be prepared to stand up, kind of representing your own journey of uh, need today, and then we just want to take a moment and pray. Um, so here's a picture of Chuck and Stephanie Ashraf and their family. Um, the Asherah family, many of you know them. Um, this is their, it's Stephanie's father, Tom, who 15 months ago was diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor, and he passed away on December 26th. And so the Asherahs are both physicians. They worship mainly online due to their work situation. Um, but I know my last conversation with Tom was at Good Friday service. He was here worshiping with us, and he came up and he wanted to share with me the companionship he'd been experiencing with Jesus in the midst of his body that was consistently fading away. And so he had a deeply rooted faith in Christ. The Ashra family were able to be with them. Stephanie was able to have some really meaningful time, she said, just a couple of days before he passed. She was grateful for that. But Chuck and Stephanie, I know you're online this morning. We're thinking of you. We're praying for you. We stand with you and your mom, Pam, during these really difficult times and we rejoice that the next time you see your dad he is going to be completely whole there will be no cancerous tumor marking his physical body amen to that huh and then yesterday morning many of you know rex and amy miller the miller family i don't know if they're here they're season ticket holders right over in this area so those of you who sit in this section you know rex and amy miller and their three wonderful kids who've grown up in our student ministry here um, Kevin is Rex's brother, Kevin Miller, um, 62 years old, and he passed away yesterday morning. Um, he was battling COVID, and uh, according to Rex, um, was completely healthy at Thanksgiving and is now gone. And so the suddenness, the grief, the loss, the unexpected uh, for him, for his sister, and for his parents. Um, so Rex, Amy, Miller family, we're praying for you. We stand with you, um, and especially in just the unexpected nature of it all. Certainly during these times that we've been living in, we recognize every single day is a gift, and we're never guaranteed the next day, and, and these moments have certainly reminded us of the brevity 
of life. So we want to pray for the Asher family. We want to pray for the Miller family. And then if you've come in this morning and you've just carrying some personal situation, whether it's you or maybe someone you want to represent, if you would just stand up, we're just going to take a moment. And as I pray, you kind of stand up and represent that in your own heart. Um, we'll keep it COVID friendly. We won't have people gather around you or anything like that this morning. But if you just want to stand kind of representing something you're carrying today, um, we want to pray for you and with you. And those of you who are still seated as those who are standing, if you just kind of glance around, I think it's important as a community to recognize who is standing and perhaps if you have a moment following service, you could uh, greet them, extend your prayers and encouragement to them. All right, let's pray together. Oh, Father, I think of Psalm 55, um, when I think of the Asherahs, I think of the Millers, I think of these folks who are standing. Psalm 55 says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. And we just cast right now our cares upon you and recognize that you are a sustaining God. And in the midst of grief and loss, in the midst of saying goodbye to someone that we never imagined at this stage having to say goodbye to, in the suddenness of it all, we pray that there would be a ministry of Jesus in those deepest valleys and darkest days. Uh, for Stephanie Ashraf and what she's experienced with her dad, thank you that Tom knows you. Thank you for the legacy of faith that he has left. And thank you for his testimony of companionship in his darkest days. And for the Miller family as they, I'm sure Rex today, thinking this is not the week he envisioned uh, living. Uh, thank you for every memory he has with his brother. And we lay at your feet the grand mystery of uh, why such a young man at such a stage of life. And so we pray for Rex and Amy, for his parents, uh, for his sister. Uh, we lift them up to you. Cover them, shower your peace and grace and mercy upon them. And then for those standing, we just by name now, you just take them, just lift up the circumstance, the situation. Thank you, you're a prayer hearing, prayer answering God. Thank you that we can bring all of these things before you and know that you hear our cries for help. When Psalm 5 says, oh Lord, consider our sighing. And so we just collectively sigh together at the weightiness of these circumstances. And we say, Jesus, hear our cry for help. Be our strength, be our hope, and be our healing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, on your way in, you should have received a message note sheet. You can pull that out there, and we can, you can follow along in the, the message notes that way. We're beginning a new series today entitled Reawakening to Jesus. Reawakening to Jesus. So I'm going to test this first Sunday of the year. I'm going to give you a little history tour. Are you ready? I'm, I'm feeling confident in how rested and refreshed you are from your holiday week that you can engage with me starting in the year 1740, right? So here's a key year in the history of our nation spiritually. We're going to do a little spiritual history of our country for a few minutes. 1740, key figure is Jonathan Edwards. There's a picture of Jonathan Edwards. He was a pastor preaching in Northampton, Massachusetts. And Edwards was burdened with his congregation about the following. He felt that there was a movement within his people of them pursuing wealth and the pursuit of money, and the desire to get rich. He saw in their hearts a desire for material things that was outpacing what he saw in their desire for Christ, and he was burdened about it. And so he began to preach into that, and he decided he's going to call the body together for a time of fasting and prayer. 1740, Northampton, Massachusetts. Let's get together. Let's pray. Let's fast. He kept preaching the word. He kept calling his people to prayer. And simultaneously, a man named George Whitfield from England arrived on the shores of Massachusetts. Here's a picture of George Whitfield. He started hosting, Whitfield did. He was an evangelist. 
He started hosting a new phenomena for America at that time, outdoor worship gatherings. He was literally crucified for doing this. Like classically, right, in church circles, when you kind of stretch out into a new method, eh, you know, all kinds of comments about it. Whitfield was pushing into new methods, and he was gathering people together in outdoor venues. And all of a sudden, hundreds turned into thousands. The largest gathering Whitfield had in 1740, in the fall of 1740, 23,000 people came together. You got to understand, way before anything like these microphones and amplified sounds, so you go, how in the world 23,000 people hearing? He stood downwind, and they said he had a set of lungs on him that could project. Could you imagine? It said 23,000 could hear very clearly the proclamation of the gospel that Whit Whitfield was giving. They said during the fall of 1740, he preached, hear this, 175 sermons in 75 days. I have no earthly idea how in the world that happened. 175 and 75, you do the math. <laughs> That's a lot of preaching. One Sunday in the fall of 1740, Whitfield started preaching, and he didn't stop for seven hours. Wait a minute, wait, hey, come on now. Seven hours, they said like, you know, you go to those concerts, right? And the, and the band finishes and they walk off the stage and what does everyone do? Well, today they get their phones out and turn their lights on, but right, we're cheering for an encore. We're like, I want more, we want more. And the band comes out and keeps playing. Whitfield kept doing that to the gathering for seven hours. Nothing even remotely like that has ever happened to me, I'm just telling you. Like at the end of a 30 to 40 minutes, like Whitfield, they're like, no, we want more. We're not done. Give us more. You can't be done yet. Preach it, pastor. Keep going, pastor. So this is the setting in the fall of 1740. It was said in New England, that whole general geographic area of our country. Massachusetts and the surrounding area in 17, between 1740 and 1742, here's what it said. 80% of the population personally heard George Whitfield preach to them in person. 80%. Can you fathom that? He, was, he became known, George Whitfield became known as the first American celebrity. Well, Benjamin Franklin was alive at the same time. He was in his early 30s. Ben Franklin, not known as an overly religious person. But he started writing, like, news reports about this, like, spiritual awakening, about this religious fervor that was sparking up. He started writing about Whitfield's gatherings. And here in 1741, here's what Ben Franklin wrote. Quote, from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, hear this, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious so that no one could walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street, end quote. Huh. How about that? It seemed as if the whole world were growing religious. Would there be a little different commentary in 2021 at the moment? So historians mark 1740 to 1742, and here's the label they pr place on that era of our nation's history, the first great spiritual awakening in America, 1740 to 1742. Fast forward 60 years, we're now in the early 1800s, and another wave of spiritual awakening starts to begin primarily in the New York City area. There's like, in the 1800s, there's this early wave in the early 1800s, and then there's a bigger wave started around 1857. Two key figures in 1857 in the city of New York. Charles Finney and Jeremiah Lanfear. So here's a picture of Jeremiah Lanfear. He was a businessman, not a clergy member, not a revivalist, not a preacher. He was a businessman. Who had come to Christ, and he was burdened about his fellow businessmen finding this Christ that he had found and tasting this grace. And, and so he decided to get together whatever other businessmen wanted to meet together at noon during the week. 
Yeah, during the day, during the week in New York City, they met at this little church, North Dutch Church. There's a picture of North Dutch Church on Fulton Street in New York City. Jeremiah Lamphere, in the fall, in September of 1857, he gets together at 12 noon on a weekday and six other business guys show up. Businessmen. They take their lunch hour and they get together and they pray in this church. And a few weeks goes by, October 1857, the great financial crisis in New York City hits. This is when the banks start collapsing, and this is when the railroads start going bankrupt. This is when the slavery question in our country really gets pressed to the surface. It looks like it's all headed towards civil war. It's like America was unraveling in every part, every part of its, like at the seams, America was just coming unravel, on the brink of total collapse. Well, in the midst of that kind of financial crisis and, and the social economic crisis and all the other crises that were going on, well, this group of businessmen just kept praying. More and more people kept coming. More and more people kept coming. And by the end of October 1857, 10,000 businessmen and businesswomen were gathering at the noon hour in New York City to pray. 10,000. Obviously, that little church couldn't hold it. It spilled out into all these other churches, started hosting noonday prayer meetings. And then that rippled out across six months. It went out to other cities, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, began to host noonday prayer meetings led by the business community. It's like the clergy and the churches just became the host, but the real spiritual leadership was provided by the lay people. And they were on their faces before God. One man shows up at a prayer meeting in Boston, Massachusetts, and he says this. He says, quote, he stands up at a prayer meeting in Boston, Massachusetts at a noon hour. He's a business guy. He says, I'm from Omaha in Nebraska. On my journey east... I have found a continuous prayer meeting all the way. We call it the 2,000-mile prayer meeting. It's 1857. 2,000-mile prayer meeting. Here's a little sign that they had at their prayer meetings. I thought this was really poignant. So when you were to show up at these noon prayer meetings, sort of said, prayers and exhortations not to exceed five minutes in order to give all an opportunity. Not more than two consecutive prayers or exhortations. No controverted points discussed. Hmm. Seemed pretty poignant for today, huh? That was their focus. They're like, we're going to get together and pray. And we're going to give everybody an opportunity to pray. Now, listen, if you had hundreds and thousands of people coming together, and they generally kept it pretty tight, 12 to 1. And they said, at its peak, if you were to show up in Wall Street, 1857, 1858 at noon hour, you weren't going to get any business done at noon. Because all the leaders were in the church praying. I wonder what that would look like at Wall Street today. Conservative estimates say between 1857 and 1860, a half a million Americans came to Christ. A half a million. And in this book, When the Fire Fell, George Davis, here's a picture of the book, and here's a quote I'm going to read from it. I commend this little book to you. It's a little pamphlet, not long, easy read, a great summary of the great revivals that have happened in our world. George Davis says this, the divine fire appeared, speaking about 1857 to 1860, in the most unlikely quarters. A large number of the aged were gathered in, <laughs> lest those of us older think we're just going to leave it up to the young people. Listen to what happened. White-haired penitents knelt with little children at the throne of grace. That could only be written in the 1800s, right? If you get crucified, you'd write something like that now. <laughs> White-haired penitents. Penitents is the word. Those who were repenting. Those who were falling on their face for God's mercy and grace on the darkness of their life. They had white hair. They had lived some life. They had gone down some roads. They said, no more. And children were leading them to grace. Whole families of Jews were brought to the Messiah. How radical is that? You know, the Jewish population is one of the most unreached corridors of our planet. And all these Jews were coming to Jesus. The most hardened were melted, some being led to Christ by the hand of a little child. 1857 to 1860, historians now mark this 
as the second great awakening in our nation. So near the end of Jeremiah Lamphere's life, remember this business guy who started this little prayer meeting, he decided to sit down and write a booklet kind of recapping the journey of all of this. The little booklet was called Alone with Jesus. There's a picture of the book here on the screen, and here's a summary of kind of his points. His summary as a, the book was kind of around that they, they wanted, he wanted to talk about, they weren't purpose-driven. They weren't prayer-driven. They were, hear this, person-driven movement, capital P. That Christ alone was their driving passion, Lamphere said. Four key points of his summary was Christ is the text. All preaching beside Christ is beside the text. Christ is the very foundation and subject matter of preaching. Preaching without Christ is building castles in the air. Christ is the life and the spirit of preaching. All preaching without him is like a body without life and spirit. Christ is the great end of preaching. Preaching is to manifest his glory. Church, that was 160 years ago. And I can't help but think that there's this growing sense going on in our nation today among the people of Jesus, among the church of Jesus. There's this growing sense that it's time. It's time for God's people to come together and unite our voices together and to lift up a cry for heaven to pour out the Spirit in a way that historians might look back on this era. And could it be that we begin to lay the seeds for the third great awakening for our nation? I believe it's so. I'm not alone in this. If you've been studying the evangelical landscape at all over the last couple years, there's many pastors, many spiritual leaders, many businessmen and business women who are coming together. I just read this week about, did you know in New York City this week, there was an all-night prayer gathering. And because New York has got so much COVID stuff going on, they couldn't do it in person. So this, this one pastor posted a screen, and it was literally just dozens and dozens of people that were praying for seven hours through the night in New York City from all different churches and all different backgrounds. And when I read about it and when I saw that, I thought, hmm, that's, it looks a little bit like Jeremiah Lampier. Interesting, it was in the same city. And so I give all that to you as a backdrop to this. As we step into 2022, here's what we're going to be doing as a church. We're uniting with several hundred, conservatively, probably a thousand plus, other Christian and Missionary Alliance churches in the United States. We're uniting together for the next 40 days, and we're going to put this together. A 40-day, not it's a 40-day prayer focus, but it's not prayer-driven, as important as prayer is to be driven. It's not purpose-driven, as important it is to be clear about purpose and mission. It's a person-driven 40 days. Prayer is a means to a bigger end. And the title from our denominational president, John Stumbo, says we're going to gather under the banner of reawakening to Jesus. That the heart and desire of these 40 days would that the person and glory and majesty and wonder of all that God is for us in Jesus would just get bigger and bigger in all of our hearts. Let it be so, O oh God. That's what these 40 days are about. And church, could it be? Could it be these become the seeds for another great awakening in our nation. And when you look at the circumstantial chaos of our country over these past few years, it sure seems to align when you study the history of the movement of God in peoples on our planet. I think we're set. And the question is, will we engage, will we enter all in with our hearts, our prayers, our devotion, our attention, and so this morning, so over these next six weeks, we're going to be looking at themes of reawakening to. Today, it's reawakening to the glory of Jesus. So we're in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 and following up here on the screen. Here is the setting. About eight days after Jesus said this. Now, when he said, said this, he's referencing the paragraph just prior to it in Luke 9. And if you know your Bible well at all, if you know that chapter well, it's a very commonly quoted section of Luke 9. It's where Jesus is telling people, hey, if you want to find your life, if you're trying to like save your life, you're going to lose it. 
you know, to really find it, you're going to have to give it away. And actually, you can actually go through life and you can achieve a whole bunch of stuff and forfeit your very soul. It's that section. He's talking about how do you really find life versus lose it. So he, he takes Peter, John, and James with him up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, verse 29, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Verse 32, Peter and his companions were very sleepy, underline that. When they became fully awake, underline that. They saw his glory, underline that. And the two men standing with him. So here's the context. It's Mount Hermon is where they believe they were making the trek up. If you've ever visited this part of the country, you know Mount Hermon is located at the intersection of where Israel and Jordan and Syria all meet today. It's where they all come together. Excuse me, Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, where they all meet today. And there's the Sea of Galilee in the foreground. So that's Mount Hermon, the snow cap. It said it was a conservative, like 10 to 12 hour hike to get to the top of Mount Hermon. So Jesus is taking them on a long and strenuous 10 to 12 hour hike. And at the end of that, he calls a prayer meeting. Huh, how's that going to go? It's hard enough to get right focused attention at a prayer meeting at the end of a 10 to 12 hour hike. Hmm. And so what I want to do with the remainder of our time is I want to focus on these three phrases that I had you underline. I want you to look in verse 32 at the trend, the connection between they were very sleepy to became fully awake to saw his glory. From weariness to awakening to glory. Say weariness. Weariness. Peter, James, and John, they were tired. They were tired. The kind of fatigue that sets in after a 12-hour hike up to 9,000 feet. That kind of weariness. And notice their weariness was hindering them from embracing what Jesus was trying to get them to embrace. He's trying to reveal his glory. It's going to be a significant moment here. And their weariness was kind of holding them back. They weren't able to see. And I don't know about you, maybe that's where the beginning of 22 finds some of you. That we just kind of in that state of a weariness that goes beyond any what a vacation can fix, kind of a soul level fatigue of the cumulative effects specifically of the last couple of years, right, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, some of you come into this year really, really exhausted and fatigued. That's this, that's Peter, James, and John right here in Mount Hermon. And Jesus addresses this kind of soul level fatigue I call it. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Here's what he says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my soul upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I want you to see there in that verse, the words Jesus chose to use there in verse 28 for weary and burden, they really come out of this space of an exhaustion that's the result of hard work. When you've spent your mind, body, energy, soul, and effort, when you've spent it on something really labor-intensive, and you just don't have any energy left. It's that. That's the nature of the words he's chosen there. And I feel like metaphorically, you know, these past couple of years, it's been like a 12-hour hike up to 9,000 feet. If you've been in any leadership position, in any capacity, in any organization, you've definitely felt this. Because just when you thought like you'd kind of hit the precipice, like, okay, we kind of got to that plateau, we're good, we're going to kind of transition and make, you find out it was just a ridge and a gateway to a whole other section of the hike. Have any of you been on those hikes? Some of you are like the crazy hikers in this congregation. Some of you take vacations, and you actually vacation in places where you go on like 12-mile hikes and call it recreation. I don't understand that, but okay. Some of you have been dropped off in air, by airplanes where there's no civilization near you and no one coming for you for many days. And you hike and you hike. And there's a weariness to the mind, body, and soul in those kinds of places. And if you come into this year where you recognize, you know, a vacation isn't going to fix this. 
Have you ever gotten so fatigued that a vacation isn't going to deal with it? The latest Netflix, whatever, you know, binge watching, that's not going to touch it. The new workout plan, nutrition plan, fast plan, whatever it is for 2022 plan, I am going to deal with it. There is a kind of weariness here that I think Jesus is speaking to that only he can address. Notice the text says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. It's, it's to Jesus that we bring this kind of, like what Peter, James, and John, if they're going to see his glory, they've got to come to Jesus with this fatigue. The prayer meeting that he was calling wasn't the prayer, wasn't the end. And this is what we, when, as we call ourselves to prayer for these 40 days, it isn't about a call to prayer, as important as prayer is, it's about a call to a person. And the way you cultivate attentiveness to Jesus is practicing prayer. It's a means to a bigger end. The prayer meeting that Jesus was calling is that they might see his glory. Could it be that for us, church? It's not a reawakening to prayer, it's a reawakening to Jesus. That's what our nation is needing, that their eyes of their soul, the eyes of our soul would be open to who they're standing there with on this mountain and what he was actually up to. But their weariness was getting in the way. And that might be where some of us need to start this prayer journey. We need to start by bringing our weariness to the feet of Jesus and saying, Lord, I've looked in all kinds of other places of what to do with this kind of fatigue the I'm spent, I'm done, I'm wiped out, I'm not sure how much more I can take type stuff. And Jesus says, you come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And maybe that's your entry into these 40 days. You just bring your weariness and soul fatigue to Jesus and let him breathe his strength, his hope, and his grace into you. Because the text says that, that, you know, they were asleep, they were not fully awake, right? They go from this stage in verse 32, where they go to this next phrase, when they became fully awake. Do you see that? That tells you they were quite drowsy. They were exhausted, it had been a long day. So from weariness to awakening, say awakening. And notice it's when they became fully awake in verse 32. Have you, have you encountered, if you haven't prayed much or prayed long for any length of time, you'll, you'll quickly learn this, like half awake and prayer don't go well together. I have found myself this past year falling asleep during my prayer times in ways like breathtakingly skilled at it, like it's unbelievable. I didn't know you could sleep in that posture, I like started kneeling and slobber puddle develops, I'm kneeling, I'm like, what in the world? Because when you're trying, like, prayer takes energy, prayer takes a focus, prayer takes an attentiveness that you can't be like half in. You can't just be kind of casual about it. It's got to, it requires a fully awake state. I reached out a couple years ago to a friend of mine who's an anesthesiologist because I wanted to understand more of like the process of how like we wake up as a person. And I actually said to him when I was talking to him on the phone, I said, hey, doc, I, I know you put people to sleep, but I actually think you make your money waking them up. I said, you know, I mean, I, if I really go to you, I'd really appreciate it if you'd wake me up. He said, fair enough, fair enough. I said, so tell me the stages, like when you have a patient on your table and they're done with their procedure and they begin to wake up, what's that process like? And he outlined it this way, stages of waking up. He said, first stage is the eyes start to open, but they're looking in different directions. They're not focused. Second stage is the eyes start to fixate on something. They get alignment. And then third stage is there's an awareness of who they are and where they are. Focus, alignment, awareness. <laughs> That's not a bad grid. That's a pretty solid grid for what reawakening looks like. So as I enter into this 40 days, I put in your notes some questions I'm asking myself. Perhaps you can ask yourself these or some others like it. I'm asking myself, where is God bringing things into focus in my life these days? What's becoming clearer to me? Focus. 
alignment? What's coming into alignment? What are the things that maybe were looking scattered before, but, but God's doing a little bit of this. He's lining some things up. And then awareness. How's my awareness? First to Jesus. Like, how's my awareness, attentiveness to Jesus, to what he's doing, and to who I am in him? This is the awakening stage, church. If we bring our weariness to Jesus, we'll find that Jesus can do some focus, alignment, and awareness with us to begin to open our eyes to see who he is, who's standing there with us on this Mount Hermon and what he's about to do. I don't want to miss that, do you? I don't always got for 20. I don't want to miss Jesus in 2022. There's got to be an awakening. I like what Mark Batterson, if I put this quote in your notes, he says, maybe we need to quit playing defense and start playing offense. Maybe we need to quit letting our circumstances get between us and God and let God get between us and our circumstances. I think that quote's for somebody here today. You come into 2022, you've got mountain-sized circumstances, and today is a call to why not let God step between you and those circumstances? That would be an awakening step. So it says, when they became fully awake, verse 32... What happened next? They saw his glory. So from weariness to awakening to glory. Say glory. So Jesus' physical appearance here changes. This had to be a crazy scene. It said it got so bright it was like lightning. It was radiant. And then he starts having a conversation with guys who've been dead for a really long time. Elijah and Moses. That why do, by the way, Peter, James, and John would have studied a lot about Elijah and Moses. They would have taught a lot of classes, probably did a lot of discipleship stuff with these guys, like teaching about these guys, and they knew they'd been dead a really long time. And here they are having a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus talks to, right, they have a conversation, and it says about the events that are to come, about his exit that's going to happen. Did you notice that in the text? He's the same word that's used in the book of Exodus about the Israelites' exodus from Egypt is the same word Jesus uses here in Luke 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration when he's talking about his upcoming exit. You can't help but, can you see the parallel? He's talking with Moses. And so he's saying, hey, just like Moses led the Israelites out of captivity and slavery in Egypt, he led them into the promised land. He's saying, hey, Peter, James, and John, you're about to witness me. You're about to watch three really gut-wrenchingly difficult days. You're going to go through crucifixion Friday and silent Saturday and resurrection Sunday. You're going to be an eyewitness to that. And it's the same kind of exit. Like Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, I'm leading all peoples out of the land of sin and death and darkness. I'm going to do it. Now, you got to give Peter, James, and John a little bit of, you got to give them a, like, that'd be a lot to process. That'd be a lot to take in. You can't do that half asleep. That's not one of those half asleep conversations with God that we're going to have, right? And Peter's response tells us how much on Struggle Street he is with this whole thing, because look at verse 33, chapter 9, verse 33. As the men were leaving Jesus, here's Peter. Peter says to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And I love how Luke inserts this little parenthesis. Don't miss this little parenthesis. What does he say? He did not know what he was saying. <laughs> oh, I love the Bible. Are you kidding me? How many times do I feel like in my own prayer life, how many times I feel like, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit says, hey, Father, so he, he doesn't know what he's saying. He... he he doesn't know what he's saying. Have you ever thought about all the prayers you've prayed that God didn't answer? And in the moment were so critically important that they'd be answered in your eyes and mine? And then years go by, and the, the little parenthesis that could be inserted in all those is, he didn't know what he was saying. The older you get, the more you rejoice in the prayers he didn't answer. Come on now. Am I the only one who feels that way? The older you get, the more you actually rejoice in the prayers he didn't answer because you recognize he was working on a plan and a circumstance situation you couldn't see. You were Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's revealing his glory. You're wanting to set up a tent and have a camp out, and Jesus is going to the cross. We didn't know what we were saying. 
That's how you know you're standing on glory ground, church. When God's up to something and you can't even put the words to it. I was up in the prayer room this morning, just kind of preparing my heart for this whole week, and just groans from my soul coming. I think it's glory. I can't put words to it, Lord. I don't know what you're doing, Lord. I don't see, I don't understand, but I know this. I know you are here, and I know you are with us, and I know you are able. And the word glory that he chose to use in Mark 9 is the common New Testament word doxa. It's in the Greek. I put it in your notes. It means a resplendent beauty. Check out this word, a magnificent that has a weight to it. I love that. So it's the glory of God that has the power and authority, hear this, to displace some things. Anybody need some things displaced in 2022? The glory of God can move some stuff. It has a weight to it. When the glory of God shows up, stuff starts moving. Like in Exodus 14, when the Red Sea parted and the Israelites crossed, the glory of God displaced the waters. In Joshua 6, when the walls of Jericho came down, it was the glory of God that shattered the bricks and the mortar. In Mark chapter 5, when the man's possessed by all these a legion of demons, it's the glory of God that displaced the evil spirits. And maybe you come into 2022, you need some waters to part, you need some walls to come down, you need some stuff displaced. And Jesus says, you bring your weariness to me. You let me open your eyes, awaken, awake my soul to see my glory. And that glory, church, can displace things. We need a revelation of the glory of Jesus. Not just in our own heart and in this body, in our nation today. If the glory of God doesn't show up and displace things, history tells us where this path goes. And so, church, today, I'm inviting us up Mount Hermon for 40 days. I'm inviting us, not in a call, just to prayer, as important as prayer. Prayer is not in a call just to a purpose, as important as purpose and mission is, but a call to a person. The glory being revealed in this text is the glory of a person. The awakening that's happening in this text is awakening to a person. The weariness that's addressed on the 10-hour hike up 9,000 feet is addressed by a person. It is a person unlike any other person, church, I have ever met in my life. And listen, at the beginning of a new year, we all sit down, we reflect, it's a good thing to do, and to think about our priorities, and to think about our plans, and we think about our relationships, and we think about the importance of, hey, we want to see this relationship grow and strengthen and deepen this year. That's a good thing to do. But as I was thinking about it this week, you know, I said, Lord, of all the relationships, I've got to go deeper. You're in a category unto yourself. You, the relationship with you, King Jesus, the priority with you, that's got to be at the top of the stack. And so I wonder, church, as we step into this year, I wonder if God wants to shift some things around. I wonder if he wants to align some things, order some things, awaken some things. And the call, it's all addressed by a person, capital P. The worship team, why don't you come on back up as I draw this to a close. Transition is to the communion table. But I want to do so with a quote. Um, I think I have it up, up here on the screen. Our country, you know, has a spiritual history. I started us in 1740. I took us to 1857. And now I land us in 2021. Just this week, a pastor in New York City wrote these words, quote, when in the course of human events, there lies such a heavy sense of injustice and despair over the proliferation of evil and the failure of any forces for good to carry the sentiment of the day, there remains only one answer, revival. 
This has been the experience of men and women throughout history, as the biblical record testifies. Hear this. The time is again ripe for that outcry to heaven for mortals who sense that things have gotten out of hand, that the forces of sin, evil, and destruction are beyond our ability to contain, end quote. It's time, church. It's time for Jesus' people to come together and with a united voice an outcry to heaven for a wide sweeping movement of the spirit that history could only record and say that's a great spiritual awakening and it starts right here right here and it may start in a place of weariness Or it may be, if you were honest, have been just like half asleep, drowsy, distracted. Might need to be awakening. I just got to stir some stuff up. But at the end of the day, we've got to see the glory. The glory that has weight to displace, to move stuff. And so, church, it's Communion Sunday, this first Sunday of the year. And these elements, they represent a person. A person whose body was broken for you, for me. A person whose blood was shed for you, for me. This is about a person. And so when we come to the table this morning and we take the elements, we do so in this posture of, Jesus, take me up Mount Hermon. Refresh, strengthen, awaken. I want to see your glory. Display some stuff, Lord. And you literally, the act of communion, you internalize. It's amazing, right? This with Jesus life. You actually, the body and the blood, you internalize. This is a Christ in you, you in Christ. This is that. And so maybe you're here this morning, you've never taken communion. And you can do that for the first time. The step is you just give your heart to Jesus. Communion is reserved. The table is set for those who are his children, who've made a decision. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And this is an act of worship to that end. And so in just a moment, I'm going to lead us through a prayer. And you can pray and give your heart to Christ. And then you can take some elements. They're there at the back table. If you didn't get it on your way in in a moment, you'll have some time to do that. There's some gluten-free options at the end of the table as well. You don't have to be a member here to take communion here. Um, you're welcome as a part of the family of Jesus. And our prayer benches, just like every Sunday, but specifically on communion Sunday, they are open. They're open to you to come. Maybe there's something God stirred this morning. You just want to come and kneel and pray and seal some things between you and him. This is your space. Or maybe you've got some things you need God to touch and heal physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. You come for healing and we anoint you with oil and pray for healing because Jesus said by his stripes we're made whole. And so as we take these elements, we trust for his wholeness in a complete way. And as we step into these 40 days, weariness, awakening, and glory. Come, come, Spirit, let it be so. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're alive. We speak to a person, the resurrected Christ, here by your Spirit, listening that we get to open up these texts that you've preserved to us that talk about these stories that draw our hearts to you. And so maybe there's someone here, maybe this morning, the first time, you're just having some clarity that you've never given your heart to Christ and become a Christian. Maybe you've known about Jesus' stuff, but today it's got to get personal. And you can just in the quietness of your heart right now and say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Save me. I recognize I've been distracted. I've been caught up in all kinds of things. I've been going down all kinds of road, but I come to you and I declare you my Savior and my Lord right now. Come forgive me, heal me, fill me, strengthen me. I take these elements as an act of worship 
recognizing your body was broken for me and my sin. Your blood was shed for me and my sin. God, would you just collectively, we just offer, we offer collectively these 40 days to you and we simply say, have your way. Have your way. Awaken us. That it might ripple out to a nation that needs the glory of Jesus to display some stuff. Make it so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the team leads through this song, um, you're welcome to take the elements. And if you want to gather together in your groups of family or friends, you're welcome to do that and come kneel and pray here. This is kind of your space. Use it as you wish.
God's people said, huh? Come on. Have a seat for a moment. I want to draw your attention to a way we've seen the goodness of God as a body collectively. And uh, I want to do that through drawing your attention to all of the monies that have been entrusted to Jesus' work through Eagle Church, through your generosity and gifts. Here's a year-end financial update. 2021 giving, as of the end of the year, $1.514 million, exceeding our budget of $1.5 million. Church. Uh, are you kidding me? In light of the year that we've had together, too, if you're kind of newer to the Eagle family, we've had a couple of pastors who've exited this year, and we've had some core families who've exited along with that, and it's just been, and it's COVID realities, and people are asking me all the time, where's this family or that family, and the question, the same answer I give, I don't know, I don't know, we try to reach out, you don't know where some people are, all the comings and goings, all the transitions, all the unique circumstances, and how good is God? to take that kind of a year. And I thought of Psalm 115 that said, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. God has been faithful. He's carried us along as a church. We're 28, going 29, almost 30 years now. And God's the one, right? And then you as a body, the way you have stewarded what God's entrusted you with. I just... I shouldn't, I guess, after 28 or so years of doing this year-end thing, I shouldn't be as surprised as I am, but just so grateful, just the way that you've stewarded what he's entrusted to you, and I commend our staff and our elders who've led so well in such unique circumstances, and then you as a body who you've just continued to pour out uh, generous, generously your first fruits of what he's given you, and our commitment to you as a church is we want to steward every single dollar. Every dollar matters, and it's stewarded for what we've been talking about this morning, you know, for Jesus' work and mission in this world, that we really believe in the person of Jesus is the greatest gift that we could offer anyone in this world. And so we will do our best to steward it to that end. And so thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Um, that's like a short little summary of what you're going to receive, a little more full and complete update, our congregational meeting in a few weeks. But I just wanted you to rejoice in it in an offering moment as we talk about giving our tithes and offering every Sunday. And you know what most of you have been doing electronically, thank you for out, super helpful for consistency. And, but if you still want to bring in your physical gifts, that's what the offering boxes in the back are for. And it's an act of worship. We integrate it into our worship service because the Bible seems, it's really clear like the people of God, when you're in relationship with God, you bring an offering to him. Like this is how it works. Uh, when you're in act of worship with God, it involves an offering. And so this is our way in our time of worship together to acknowledge through our physical gifts his goodness to us. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all you've entrusted to us. Thank you for what these numbers represent, for every dollar, every check, every online transaction, every life that's been touched, every student and child and family and adult, every person that's been helped, every missions thing that's been moved forward from refugee ministries to overseas work to things on the west side and all the things in between. Just thank you, thank you, thank you that you would entrust us to steward what you've given us to steward. We acknowledge, Lord, that you have been good, you have been faithful, you have been generous. And so we take these moments in our worship service, in the giving of our tithes and offering, and from a depth of a heart of worship towards you, we offer these gifts to you because you are worthy. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's stand together one final song, and then we'll have a wrap up. to join the song song long before our lives to raise a voice along heaven and earth alive we've seen your face of a thousand 
Amen. Have a seat for a moment. Draw your attention to a few items before the benediction. Well, on your way out, you can pick up a little pamphlet size, this little insert called What's Next? What's going on winter 2022 around here? All kinds of connection and discipleship opportunities listed on here, obviously starting with our 40 days of prayer. And so from a prayer standpoint, you go to eaglechurch.com slash prayer. Eaglechurch.com slash prayer. There's a whole web page there that's built around these 40 days. There are daily devotionals for adults, for students, and for children. All there accessible on the web page. Encourage you to jump in, be a part of those each day. That's where you sign up for time in our prayer room. If you've never been to our prayer room up there in that corridor of the building, you sign up for various hours there. You can spend some time up in that sacred space. I want to encourage you to do so. Eaglechurch.com slash prayer all things for these 40 days of prayer. And then obviously we've got these other opportunities on Tuesday night, still at 6.30, Travis Bryant, one of our elders, gathering with whomever wants to come and pray. It sounds a lot like Jeremiah Lamb Fear type yeah, prayer gatherings, right? There'll be just a few, five, six, seven people. We're just praying. That's all we're doing. 6.30 on Tuesday nights in the atrium, you can come to that. And then there'll be other things you'll be hearing about as it unfolds. But we've got discipleship classes starting on Sunday morning with Julia and Annie, that she, they're going to be leading a class on Life of Peter. Perspectives class is starting up in a couple weeks. Still an opportunity. The table's out there that Chuck and Tom can fill you in on the details. It starts up on the 19th of this month. We've got men's uh, gatherings, women's gatherings. Ample opportunities for you to take a next step in your relationship with Jesus here in early 2022. So we try to provide the avenues as a church and the resources, and now you as a body, you take a step to what fits your needs best and take a step towards Jesus this year. Can we do that? And lastly, before the benediction, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, it's been a year where we have had some subtractions from a staffing standpoint, right? We've been a little thin on the staffing front. We've said goodbye to some staff members that we've loved that served us faithfully so well. Um, and it's been a process for us as a staff. We've been operating a bit shorthanded. And I thank so much. I thank our staff and our elders team and so many of you as lay leaders. Like our whole worship ministry has primarily been carried along for the last several months by lay leadership, by these kinds of folks who rise early and stay up late and learn music and all the things in between. I mean, our entire Christmas Eve experience was primarily carried out by all of you. There's been very few staff hands available to carry out what in the past we've been able to carry out. So I say all that to say this. It is with great joy that I announce to you that we have made a next hire here at Eagle Church, and I want to introduce you to our newest member of our pastoral staff. His name is Ted Harris. Let's give it up for Ted and Sarah Harris. So Ted and Sarah Harris uh, and their three wonderful children, I've known Ted for over 25 years. So Ted comes with a wealth of pastoral experience, 33 years of pastoring in the Christian Missionary Alliance. Just a wonderful man of God, deeply loves the Lord, loves his family, loves God's word, and has served so faithfully. I've admired Ted for so many years. We've been in the same district for a lot of years. That's why I've known him for so many. He's currently lead pastor at Muncie Alliance Church in Muncie, Indiana. So about right now, Muncie Alliance Church is learning that their lead pastor is exiting and joining us. So we can be praying for Muncie Alliance Church because they're a very beloved pastoral family. I approached Ted Harris a few months ago with this statement. I said, hey, Ted, we were at a pastor's gathering together. I said, hey, Ted, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for someone like you to join our staff. And he's super networked. So I was like, can you network me to anyone who's like you? You know, experience. I kind of went through the, the details of his, what I admire about his character and his leadership. And a couple weeks goes by and my phone rings and it's Ted. And Ted said, hey, were you serious about you still looking for someone like me? He said, would you be interested in talking to me? I said, yeah, Ted. And that started the conversation, which then involved a call to our boss, our district superintendent, Bob Petty, because um, our joy is his problem at this point. You follow me? So as you might imagine, it's, it's a challenging time to try to find experienced pastors and place them in churches. We have massive numbers of churches with open pastoral positions because there aren't as many qualified and trained and mature pastoral candidates available like there used to be. It's just it's part of the realities and challenges of these days. So Muncie Alliance, we need to be praying for them as they enter into a pastoral search. But Ted will be stepping in with us and sharing the pastoral leadership load around here, of which with great joy I say that to you. 
And he's a wonderful leader, and you're going to enjoy getting to know him. His primary responsibilities, his title's going to be associate pastor. What does that mean? Well, he's going to be carrying a large spiritual leadership load around here under the banner of, like, pastoral care and helping with all the pastoral leadership responsibilities that come in in all of our lives. We've all got a lot going on, and there's a lot of things going on in this body where we could just use a pastoral presence a little bit more, and uh, he's going to do a great job in that space. And then he's going to be helping with staff management, staff leadership, and staff oversight, which will be huge. Like the operational day-to-day running of Eagle Church and its ministries is primarily going to be through Ted's leadership. It's going to be a great gift to all of us as a church, and he'll be sharing in some preaching and teaching here for sure, and some other classes and that, Um, and he's going to be helping specifically in the small group ministry space. We've got a lot of work to do in the relational infrastructure of our church, and Ted comes with a tremendous amount of experience. So he's been lead pastor for the last seven years at Muncie, and the prior 26 years is that, he was in an associate pastor type role, and he has discerned in his own words, which he'll tell you in a few weeks, that he's learned he's better suited for that associate pastor place versus the lead pastor space, and that's why he was so open to a conversation, and because our relationship was such that it just seemed to be such a great fit, and I'm just super excited, super grateful for Ted and Sarah and their family, and super excited for you to be able to meet them. So timing of transition is end of this month. He's going to spend most of January helping Muncie transition. He's planning on being physically here on January 30th, so hoping to be able to introduce him to you face-to-face there. We'll plan some type of reception after service that day, and then he'll be in the office kind of up and running February 1 is the current plan that we've all learned to hold them very loosely these days, but that's our current plan that we'll just hold before the Lord and and trust, but sooner rather than later, uh, you'll be having another set of pastoral hands around here helping lead, so praise Jesus. Thank you so much for your prayers, and thanks for... Yeah. Let's stand together. I want to send you out with a benediction. If you're newer with us today, stop at the Guest Central, get a gift bag. We'll give you some free stuff. It's great having you here. We'll continue our series in Reawakening next week. Please join us and stay connected with us during these weeks. Matthew 17 is Matthew's recording of Luke 9's Mount Transfiguration. There's one sentence I want to send you out with. It's Matthew 17, verse 8. It says this about their experience on Mount Hermon. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And so as you go forth today, go forth as the people of Jesus, walking the road that he has set before you this year. And no matter what circumstances are thrust in front of you, may the glory of God lift up your eyes and that you might only see Jesus. And in that, set some things right. Go as a people under his covering this year. Amen.